we are live doctor okay bismillahir rahmanir rahim and uh, welcome everybody to this first lecture of uh, course uh, on real statistics in this uh, i will first start by presenting some uh, basics of this course and, uh, uh then uh, as uh, people have been informed uh, we will actually be discussing the first uh, chapter introductory and um, so i think i will be discussing the details in the presentation all right so um this uh, is the first lecture but it is actually a preliminary we are not actually starting the course this is these are some ideas which uh, are covered in chapter 0 which is sort of a introductory and experiential um chapter and uh, technically everyone who is participating is supposed to have read the chapter but actually i have opened it up for everybody so uh there may be many people who have not actually read the first chapter in the audience but in the future uh basically there are 12 chapters in the book and uh we will be covering one chapter every two weeks so it will take about 6 months to cover the whole course and uh before the first lecture it will be on 9th october the first lecture will cover chapter 1 then uh we will close the registration for the course and then uh, subsequent lectures will be open only to registered participants <clears throat> so um we are just going to talk about some procedural details now this is a synchronous course which means we will be all going through the course together uh and we will be covering one chapter every two weeks uh, later on i will put this material on um on self autopilot and people can go through it in a asynchronous way at their own pace but for the moment this course is going to be everybody together uh the uh, dates may be somewhat adjusted but basically it will be sundays at 6 uh, like this uh to allow for the largest possible range of convenient times for everybody uh there are five sections in each chapter we will create five discussion groups to answer discussions for each section uh, we tried to do this on this particular section but because of shortage of time uh this could not be done very effectively but for later lectures we will follow this methodology that uh students will actually read the text watch the videos and discuss the assignments and then uh when we have the live lecture it will be mostly interactive students will discuss their uh um, responses to the material presented in the chapter and i will um, uh, guide the discussion and uh, there is a sheet that i've asked for information uh, this will be sent to all registered students later All right so uh, this is the first and last time i will actually teach this course because i have a lot of other materials to develop and cover hopefully i will be develop this this course will only cover very basic statistics statistics it is meant to be this course is exactly designed for teachers of introductory statistics uh and so i hope that from the graduates of this course there will be teachers who will be able to both teach this course which is for a master trainer course and also teach the basic statistics course itself which is offered in nearly every department in every university all around the world so there is a huge amount for demand for this basic statistics course and uh, i will be trying to be closely engaged with all students so 
monitoring their progress and everything and making sure that um, everybody is keeping up with the materials. Primarily because I'm working on finalizing the textbook. You will be going through a draft of the textbook. And then from the feedback that I receive, I will polish and finalize and prepare the manuscript for publication. Now, some of the distinctive features of this course is that, <clears throat> what do we mean by the title real? This, this is a meaning. And this meaning is very different from what we are taught in conventional statistics. What I'm saying is that data cannot be analyzed in isolation. If we want to do data analysis, we have to understand where the data come from, what real world context generated the data. One of my friends, now deceased, Friedman, David Friedman, used to say that you need to expend shoe leather to learn about causality. That is, you have to go and walk about in the real world in order to learn about causality. You can't do it sitting at desks and analyzing numbers. Exactly the same data set would be analyzed very differently depending on the real world context, which is why you can't analyze data independently of the real world. Despite the fact that this is what every statistics textbook teaches. Statistics textbooks teach how to analyze data without actually referring to where the data comes from. Now this makes things difficult because real world circumstances are unique. Every data set is unique. And so there is no general method which applies to all data sets. Uh, so learning real statistics is difficult because you have to do it on a case by case basis. And then that means that students have to learn it in an apprentice like fashion. Okay, I had this data set, I analyzed it, I got this result. And then you take another data set and little by little students get the experience so that they can tackle a new data sets on their own, but they will have to learn to think there is no standard canned package of technique which can be applied. So just to give a very simple example, uh, consider this very uh, trivial data set, 18, 20, 25, 31, 36, 40, these are six numbers. Uh, what can we do with this data set? Well, we can um, find the mean and the variance, et cetera. And suppose somebody says, okay, this is a data set, uh, find what is the next value of this going to be? So forecasting problem. Well, if you look at the data set, you will see that on the average, the changes are around five units. So one possible uh, um, prediction is that the next value will be 45. But you can also see that the changes are going from six to five to four units in the last three periods. So if we ca ca catch that trend, then we can say, okay, the next one will be only three higher. So 43 would be a a good way to go. Uh, there is also an argument to be made that it could be uh, 44 or 45 or even 46. You can make up an argument for almost any number like this between 43 and even up to maybe 48. So these are all good forecasts without knowing anything about the data. But if we, this, this is a question of nominal statistics. Uh, in real statistics, we reject the question. We say that this question cannot be asked because we don't analyze data sets. We, uh, the goal of knowledge is to take a data set and use it to learn about the real world. If the real world is not there, then there's nothing to do. So actually, if you look at the data set, this is the maximum monthly temperature from January to June in um, Islamabad over, uh, so this is monthly data. So the next value was actually 35 because June is the hottest month and the temperature starts to decline. So you understand that how uh, the real world context completely changes the picture. Previously, the automatic forecasts are best, just based on looking at the pattern, but the pattern isn't, isn't, isn't real. The pattern is due to the fact that the first six months, the heat is increasing and then the, but now suppose that this was yearly heights of children measured in some unit, like uh, maybe inches. Then um, 
obviously uh, the next data set would have a next forecast would have some very different implications. And suppose that the uh, readings were reversed, we had 41st and 36 later, then we would say that this is, must be a recording er error because height cannot be declining by five inches. So um, suppose on the other hand that this second data set with uh, 18, 20, 25, 31, 36, 40, and 35 is the number of major fires in Belgium. Then uh, we would say, okay, there's something happened to control the fires. Uh, the fires had been going up, but now they're going down. So there must have been some successful fire control program launched. So we should go and see what the fire department is doing in Belgium. Suppose these were the annual infant mortality rates. Then we would say, okay, uh, uh, this country has had uh, worsening health conditions, but somehow they managed to get things under control in the past year. Maybe they introduced a successful health program. So you understand that this is what real statistics is about. Real statistics cannot be done just by looking at the data. You have to go into the real world. And the goal of real statistics is to learn about the real world, not to learn about the numbers. All right. Some of the major concepts to be covered is that index numbers are arbitrary. I found from experience that this is the hardest concept to get across to students. That rankings of colleges of students, this is the best student, this is the best college. These are all arbitrary and subjective. This cannot be done objectively. Um, this has radical implications because a lot of the statistics that we do, what is the impact of corruption on um, development or things like that, these are all based on index numbers. And index numbers are all arbitrary. So basically all the results that we are looking at when we analyze World Bank data sets, these are just subjective and arbitrary and can be changed in any way you like once you understand this arbitrariness. Conventional statistics is a useful descriptive tool. They allow you to look at the data, but you cannot do anything more from the real point of view. Uh, looking at the data is just meant to provide you with clues to what is happening in the real world. So it's, it, you, you cannot do inference uh, using data alone. Knowledge is learning about the real world, not about the numbers. So knowledge will be produced by taking those clues in the patterns in the data and following them up by investigating what is happening in the real world, which produces these clues. And this is never uh, done in conventional statistics. And so basically conventional statistics cannot produce knowledge according to our uh, conception of real statistics. Just a uh, little while ago, uh, I saw this news item about how Columbia University provided fake data to climb and uh, to make an amazing climb in the rankings. And there have been many such scandals, but the real lesson from this has not been learned. It is not that you, by fudging the numbers you can rise in the ranking, is that there is no correct way to do the rankings. This is hard to understand, but we will cover that in uh, the first two or three lectures. All right. so. <clears throat> What is the basic uh, fundamental uh, problem that we are trying to fix? That comes from basically the theory of knowledge, which has been studied in uh, some detail in this uh, first chapter, in this zeroth chapter, and we will discuss some more in the next chapter. But this is the philosophy behind the course, the actual course, which will start in the second lecture, uh, about a month from now, we will be just doing data analysis. But data analysis for real data sets, not for fake arbitrary data sets. Because as, as I said, in real statistics, uh, we cannot analyze data in isolation. So basically, the current uh, foundation of statistics is based on logical positivism. And this logical positivism is a false theory of knowledge. So what we are doing is we are replacing LP by Islamic epistemology. And this provides new 
realist foundations for the discipline. Now there is the question that is this only going to be studied by Muslims? So basically that's not true, but there are a couple of points which are not well understood or known. Logical positivism it's, is itself a religion. So it's not that you can, you can, um, you are, you are going from a secular non-religious basis to a religious basis. Basically, every study, every analysis must be built on some theory of knowledge which is metaphysical. So you can't do without metaphysics, but the only thing is that logical positive is a toxic metaphysics which is repugnant to human nature. Islamic epistemology is a natural theory of knowledge which is acceptable to all human beings. It is built on rejecting selfish personal goals by bigger visions and the desire to serve humanity by acquiring useful knowledge. So there is nothing in the foundations that will be um, that will be um, that will be so strongly Islamic that uh, non-Muslims will find it difficult to accept. But we will be using concepts about the theory of knowledge which are built on Islamic foundations provided by Imam al-Ghazali, who was, who was studied by all European thinkers. So basically, although his, his key insight was not absorbed or accepted. So basically, we are looking at philosophical foundations uh, and um, there is no difficulty for non-Muslims to be studying this course. Okay, so now we're going to be discussing some new concepts and tools uh, and some of the central concepts are probability. Now, uh, as uh, you may know or you may re have realized, the, there are two standard definitions. 90% of the textbooks use uh, frequency theory. Now, frequency theory is an absurd definition because it says that, okay, the probability is defined by flipping a coin infinite number of times. So that's ridiculous because it can never be done. Now, we, when, when we read this definition, we automatically assume that it means that, okay, infinite number is, can't, is impossible, but maybe we can do it a thousand times or a million times. Now, the problem is that if you use thousand times or million times or billion times, it doesn't work. No finite segment is an approximation to infinity. And people who have analyzed that, okay, let's, let's just take one million flips as the basis. It just doesn't work. Then probability doesn't get defined correctly because the probability of a coin coming up exactly 50% heads in a million trials is close to zero. So close to zero that uh, it's negligible. So the probability will not be 50%. So every probability is different and it's different every time you flip the coin. So there is no way to define probability correctly using frequency theory. Bayesian theory is even worse. It says that probability is just your opinion about it doesn't have anything to do with the real world. So that the, the, the two standard definitions found in nearly all textbooks are wrong. Uh, and there is a correct definition which we will study in this course. Similarly, causality is massively mishandled because causality is again a hidden concept about the real world. It is not, a, a, causality is never in the numbers. It's always in the real world. So that's why it's basically impossible to use nominal statistics, study the numbers alone and learn about causality. It's just impossible. You have to learn about the real world in order to uh, learn study causality. That's why there's an infinite debate, huge amount of papers about causality. None of them come to the right answer. Same thing goes for econometrics. All inference depends on assumptions of the reg regression model which are covered. But in nearly all applications that we do, these assumptions are false. So regression models almost never give useful results. Now, there are a few exceptions in engineering and agriculture. There are physical real world processes with known technologies and determinants. But in economics, this almost never happens. But we will not be studying econometrics in this course. Uh, but this is just to let you know that uh, these things apply. Now, for the course itself, basic Excel skills will be essential. 
and there are many sources for this. So if you don't know Excel, uh, then I recommend that uh, you learn this within the next month before the chapter two, because we will be using a lot of Excel and just basic skills, not, not, not a big deal to learn. And most people should know that already. All right, so that's the end of this presentation. And one thing that I would like to say, okay, so that's all. Now we are going to go through the, uh, we're going to go through, uh, just one second. My screen. All right, so um, I'm going to the next um, thing on the agenda. There's a question from Sayyid. Uh, go ahead and ask. Uh, can you, can he unmute? Uh, yes, I believe he can unmute. Yes. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. Uh, basically, I'm new to this course and I believe this is the first lecture for statistics. Uh, yes. But uh, when I try to enroll through the LAMFE website, it is not uh, like I'm not able to log in because uh, they are showing me some password or something error. But uh, I already have an account. Uh, I don't know in why. this lecture, we will, uh, uh, we will figure these out. There is a, um, you, you can write to me or uh, go to the MESS website. This is actually for the text. Now, um, there is a, the first, uh, the first um, agenda. Okay, so we have gone through the chapter zero and we have divided the 100 or so participants, more than that, about 150 actually, into groups of 20. And um, we will, um, in each group has gone through one of the five sections and this will be the general procedure for this course uh, and then there are four questions discussion for discussion in each section so um, the first uh, group uh, is uh, let's see who is the first group are we do we have the pre uh, present the presenters for the first group section a Who is handling section A? Can you raise your hand, please? Saira? Are you here? Um, let's find this. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Ah, wa alaikum assalam. Sir, me and Dr. Saul is basically. Uh, the group leaders of uh, section A, group A. All right. So, Uzma, are you going to present? Yes, sir. Sir, I will discuss uh, the basic summary of this section and Dr. Sood will discuss the uh, questions. Answer. All right. Please go ahead and discuss the summary. I will take a small five-minute break for Maghrib and anybody who needs to do so can um, uh, go away briefly and come back. I will uh, come back very quickly and listen to the discussion and uh, respond, uh, but uh, this, this is going to go through the Maghrib, so everybody who needs to do so can take a break. But Uzma, go ahead and uh, proceed because recordings will be made available. Proceed and uh, describe the, the section, the, make a section summary, and then discuss the four questions, and I will come back and comment on this discussion. All right? Okay, okay sir. Take, a, take, take the leads, uh, Uzma. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, hopefully my screen is uh, visible to everyone. Okay, in this section, Dr. Sazaman is basically discussing about his own life experience that uh, all of you know that he has been trained in the Western education system 
and uh, his higher education is from MIT and Stanford. So he basically discussed that uh, how this Western education system has created a secular mindset which leads to meaningless lifestyle. And uh, the conflict that he uh, mainly faced, and also I think uh, all of us also uh, are also going through this, is that does the Quran contain complete and perfect guidance for us today? Or our uh, modern problems can only be solved by the Western knowledge, while the Quran is mostly irrelevant. So in this section, he is basically trying to answer this question. First of all, he has discussed about his early life experience, uh, like uh, uh, from uh, up till 15 years. Uh, his father uh, played a very important role in his training, and he has specifically discussed three crucial takeaways from the father's training, like number one, parents love faith play a very important role. It gives children the courage and aspiration for high vision. Secondly, always think by yourself and not be influenced by the thought of the crowd. And the third one is the formal education as a paper chase. The credentials were necessary, but only life experience provides us with real education. So I think uh, all of us must be agree with uh, all three points. Maybe uh, for me, the second point will, might be more, or the third point is more important. And maybe uh, some of you may think that the first point is important, but all three points have a uh, very uh, important in the children's training. And we will discuss it later on in the question answer section. Uh, later on, he discussed about his uh, uh, formal uh, education. He basically took his formal education, uh, has basically completed his formal education by the age of 22. Uh, he did a B.S. from uh, in mathematics from uh, MIT, and uh, his uh, Ph.D. and M.S. is uh, from Stanford. So uh, basically, MIT taught him about uh, the physics, chemistry, biology, but nothing about how to become a better human being, and nothing about the meaning of life. So that's the dilemma of our education system uh, that uh, it doesn't taught it about uh, taught us about uh, that how we can become a good human being. I also believe that uh, another dilemma of our education system is that the content that we are taught to our students is almost outdated and has no practical relevance. Like for example, nowadays you see that uh, ISLM model that is uh, basically uh, taught uh, us uh, is basically it is basically based on the assumption that the uh, money supply is the exogenous and the fixed. But nowadays you see that money supply is no more exogenous. It is basically an endogenous phenomenon. But still, we are teaching our students with the same ISLM model. So uh, further, we discuss that the central question we all face in our life is how can we make the best possible use of the precious few moments we have been granted on this planet. So the Western environment, informal and experiential education trained us to be basically selfish. We just focus on our own player, profit maximization, power gain without any concern for other society and other person. So uh, while searching for the truth, he searched through different philosophies of life, through different uh, religions and lifestyle. Later on through the bleak, he learned that the faith is the condition of a heart and not of the mind. That is why it cannot be developed by arguments and counter arguments. To believe and trust in God means feeling certainty in your heart that God will take care of you, regardless of how adverse circumstances appear to be. For example, in Quran, Allah SWT basically discussed, uh, uh, told us about uh, the uh, Hazrat Musa al Islam that uh, facing the hill in front of him and the army of your own behind him with no apparent chances of escape. Musa Islam is not worried about anything, unlike his followers. He says that God is with me and he will guide us out of this difficulty. And I believe all of us must have seen this and experienced this in our life. Whenever we are in such situation that there is no way to go out, if we just leave it to Allah, then Allah definitely meant the way. And he basically took us out of those situations. Uh, I, uh, I must also quote here, my uh, grandfather usually said that it is, it is not the peel who is common. It is basically the jakeen that is the common. It is our jakeen that basically help us to get out of the situations. So the deep conflict created by the faith is that we believe that Quran provides us the complete and the perfect guidance for all time. Historical record shows that Islamic teachings took mankind from death of ignorance to Pinnacle of wisdom 14 centuries ago, but the Western education taught us that the knowledge created in the West over the past few centuries is the only type of valid and worthwhile knowledge. So all this, including the Quran, is ignorance and superstition. So for the guidance today, we don't need to look at the Quran. We can do and perform well just by following the Western intellectual tradition. 
so the western education trains us to be uh, to ignore our hearts and just follow our minds and that they mainly focus <coughs> on the rational behavior that we every individual is rational and they basically work for their own self interest so this kind of thinking arose in the west due to destructive warfare between christian section with european to reject christianity as a basis for public life so the trauma of loss of faith led them to reject the herd and intuition as the basis of knowledge and unfortunately we are also experiencing this thing even among the muslim sect so in contrast quran states that for indeed it is not the eyes that are blinded but the blinded are the herd so the islamic teaching place great emphasis on the herd as a guide to the truth so my herd basically testifies to god and to the power of the message so the central question posed by life are not addressed at all by the western knowledge while the quran provides us the complete and the perfect guidance about it now i will request the uh, dr saud ahmed to discuss about uh, the question answer session that are given at the end of this uh, session okay good <clears throat> Yes, go ahead, sir. Are you present, sir? Hello, is the sound there? Sir, excuse me. If not, you can continue and present the question yourself. If sound is not there, I don't. I don't. Let me see him on the screen. Yeah. I don't see Saud on this on my. screen so why don't you finish the second part as well to the answers cuz i don't see sound okay usma usma yes sir i'll just receive a message from dr saud that there is no electricity at his side oh i see oh, okay uh, so go ahead then and uh do the questions also by you um are you there is my can you please just screen? one minute uh, just one please sir okay So the first question is about uh, that based on your own life experiences as well as the discussion in the section above what are the some critical elements of training that one should provide to their children choose one among these elements and explain why it is important so basically in this uh, uh, discussion uh, three main points uh, are the takeaways uh, uh, that basically dr zaman has uh, talked about from his father training in the first is the parents love faith Uh, play very important role and give children the courage and inspiration for high values and second is always think by yourself and not be influenced by the thought of the crowd 
and the third one is the formal education as a paper chase the credentials were necessary but only life experience provide us with real education uh, for me i think uh, uh, that uh, uh, the second point that we should always think by ourselves and uh, not be influenced by the thoughts of the crowd uh the first one it uh, uh, is also important that the parents love and care does play important role but i think that uh, uh, besides that it uh, your own self awareness also play a very important role if we should uh, basically taught our children to be self aware what they think about the world how they basically take the think it's not the, a good idea to just follow the uh, world as it is what the other are doing and you also just follow that we should ask from all set what we think what is the right and what is the uh, wrong and follow our own, our own intuition and then we should decide that uh, which path or which field we should move on secondly uh, that uh, yes i totally agree that uh, today's our education system is uh, just to meant a degree and it is basically not uh, uh, focusing on the character building or the telling us about the truth even um i if uh, just uh, uh, look towards my own uh, educational career i never uh, think that i get as such uh, i think before uh, taking any course from dr zaman in my msc field degree before that i also never thought in that way that uh, it uh, i'm thinking in uh, right now that uh, what is the purpose of my life and why i'm here so basically uh, but not every teacher is like dr ustad zaman who basically train us to think in this way so uh, coming towards the second question the central question we all face is what is the best possible use we can make of the pre uh, precious few moments of life we have been granted and how would you answer this question well um i believe that uh, as our life is very limited and uh, we are here for a very short period of time and the every moment that we are living is very important so uh, it's very important that we should know what is our goal why we are here in this world for me uh, my life goal and my every moment is uh, uh, like i believe that i am just uh, here like for ibadat we are uh, angels are there and we uh, basically our purpose should be to help the mankind for me it's important that whatever uh, whoever is in my circumstances whoever is in my life like uh, if i'm a teacher then my students my family my friends so i should try my best to basically ease their life to help them in their every aspect the knowledge provided to ignorant and backward sudin in the form of quran launched a revolution which shapes history even today 14.5 centuries afterward what was the revolutionary aspect of this knowledge and does this knowledge continue to be revolutionary even today give your answer well this knowledge still uh, this uh, knowledge still has the same power but i believe that uh, uh, at that time uh, hazrat pak sallallahu alaihi wasallam was there to basically teach them but now at our time we don't have uh, like uh, in dil sense hazur pak sallallahu alaihi wasallam so uh, and we are basically uh, our education system is that we are so much influenced by the western ideology western concept that we think that quran don't have that power and don't have that uh, um, uh, wisdom that basically help us to get out of this situation but the problem is that we never try to understand what is the true message of quran we most of us has never tried to basically uh, uh, read quran with translation to understand what actually uh, allah subhanahu wa taala want to uh, give of the message so if we actually try to understand what is the message of the quran then definitely it will help us and it will definitely bring the revolutionary in this world like i remember that when uh, there is one sentence that is repeatedly um, uh, said in the quran is that Uh, I will just say it in Urdu that uh, क्या आप ये समझते हैं कि बगैर आजमाए ही आपको इनाम दे दिया जाएगा मगर बगैर आजमाइश के अल्लाह ताला हमें कैसे जन्नत में पहुंचा देंगे हमें जन्नत कैसे मिल सकती है बगैर आजमाइश के so it means that this life is basically a test for us we are not here to enjoy uh, the worldly benefits we are here for an a test and an exam so for every stage of life we are facing some test and we have to go through those tests and if you are successful and if we are fast then definitely we have a very good life here after
so have you experienced the conflict between her truth and the training provided to you by your education if so provide uh, describe one such conflict and write your own thoughts about this conflict our education system uh, broadly saying that it uh, yes claim that it will uh, basically bring development modernity ease and prosperity for everyone we don't uh, uh, no doubt that exploration of scientific knowledge and technological revolution has brought both the benefits as well as destruction for humanity so it's quite evident now that the greed for profit and capitalization uh, help cultivate and promote a consumerist society devoid of moral values that could achieve higher human objectives so such a developmental model is no longer uh, sustainable as it brings misery and poverty for the masses and pollution and the natural disasters for the environment so these conflict and half truth compels me to provide that there is some vital component which is grossly lacking in our education system thank you sir so right. these are the basically uh, four questions very good i was going to uh, make some comments but i think you have done everything uh, just perfectly so i don't have any particular comments to make so now i would like to shift this to maaz and navid who are responsible for the next second which one of them to is uh, as present and who is going to do the presentation maaz or navid maaz are you going to do the presentation now uh sir i think navid is going to present uh, uh, his okay. part that is the summary part and then i will be presenting the question part fine navid are you there yes sir i am here okay can you give him the uh, hosting privileges please uh, okay good okay. uh sir the second part of uh, this chapter is uh, regarding the conflict conflicting bodies of the knowledge so uh, there are uh, uh, one uh, western knowledge which uh, uh, have encompassed uh, all of the modern age uh, which revolves around the physical sciences and uh, have ventured to apply the generalization and rules uh, from the physical sciences to apply it in the social sciences while on the other side uh, we have the islamic knowledge uh, which is uh, which has a central question of for the purpose of life and the purpose of creation of human being so there is a deep dilemma uh, between the faith and reason uh, in this scenario uh, this deep uh, dilemma uh, is uh, regarding the the conflict between heart and head and uh, one uh, on one side there is uh, intuition uh, which uh, search on uh, the purpose of life while on the other side the western knowledge uh, does not regard regarding anything unobservable uh, so um, edward said uh, um, uh, is the person uh, who wrote orientalism uh, uh, regarding this uh, deep dilemma uh, between the two theories of knowledge and he uh, actually uh, propounded this uh, uh, this issue uh, in a sense that uh, the knowledge being created by the west uh, Uh, is for a purpose to serve the uh, the powers so mm, the the role of power in shaping the knowledge uh, has been vividly stated by uh, edward said and uh, uh, he was the one who inspired our uh, our teacher uh, dr masad zaman saheb so uh, uh, there is a, um, a need to take small steps to reject this uh, falsified and erroneous uh, uh, basis of knowledge uh, and uh, paul uh, baroch has uh, very uh, clearly depicted in his book uh, economics and world history that how these uh, falsified theories have been developed to serve the interest of certain nations which were in power in those times and how certain other powers uh, who contested for dear share of the power and they uh, in in the uh, shape of uh, theory of infant uh, industry how they are uh, infant economies how they uh, contested for their share so um, uh, this uh, uh, black face of uh, um, western knowledge uh, has uh, come to uh, uh, perform and shape uh, the modern knowledge of uh, uh, statistics and uh, uh, we are uh, going to um uh, to wash out those uh, 
uh, black things from the knowledge of the statistic. Over to you, Mas Javed. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, this, shall I share uh, my screen or can I just continue with this? It's okay, you can continue. Okay, uh, if, if you can, can you just please um, uh, make it bigger if possible? For, I think it would be helpful for the slide show mode. And... Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, as Nabit has just summarized uh, the section B, uh, at the end of the section, there are some questions posed, and uh, one of these questions was uh, revolving around uh, whether the education we receive uh, today from the Western uh, source of knowledge, whether it is helpful uh, for us in our uh, to betterment of our lives today, and if yes or no, so what are the arguments from our side? So actually, uh, I am going to just summarize here the arguments that uh, our group has posed. So uh, one of these arguments is that the formal education that is uh, being, uh, actually we have uh, earned many years uh, and invested many years in just getting this education from our formal education system. And all of these was uh, around the physical sciences, like uh, what is being done or what is uh, revolving around us and how the world is being uh, working around us like physical science, like physics, chemistry, etc. But the actual question uh, is being posed here is that wh what is uh, what it has to do uh, or what, whether it answers the other type of questions that comes with our, from our heart, like uh, what is the purpose of li our life? What is our objective of life? So there is a kind of a dichotomy there. So I think uh, screen is not being shared now. Yes. Uh, do you have co-host now? Can you do you have a screen share button on your? Yeah. Computer? Yeah. Okay, then you can take it over and share your own screen. All right. So I hope it is visible. Yes. It is visible. Okay, so actually there is a kind of dichotomy there. Uh, so for me, uh, like we can say that there is uh, so different questions that are being posed and different kind of answers are being uh, given to us. So some of the questions that are being posed, like uh, mostly from our mind, uh, that what are being or what how the world is being working around us, how the, what is the rules of the nature under which these world is uh, or what natural phenomena is going to work. So these kind of questions are being uh, posed and answers are being given through Western knowledge. Uh, but the actual questions that are uh, being raised uh, in our heart, uh, like the objectives and objective of life, how can we spend our life uh, and how can we spend like better life just not for ourselves but for our for others also so I, I think it is a kind of a rule uh, that this islam the religion of islam is just uh, or is uh, given to us on our own nature uh, for instance uh, if we want betterment for our lives then we should uh, we should be think better for others also so this is the kind of uh, we can say uh, a good answer that only Islam gives us, and it also attacks to our heart. But uh, these kind of teachings, uh, we have never heard about these kind of teachings from the Western source of knowledge. So there is a huge gap, and uh, this uh, blank space between these two extremes, I think, can only be fixed, can only be filled up uh, when we're going to uh, uh, implement this Islamic knowledge that uh, we have maybe in our books today only. And so we have to implement and absorb this knowledge and implement it in our lives so that we can maybe uh, uh, like the revolution happened 14 years ago, 1400 years ago. So maybe that revolution just can happen now with that same knowledge. Uh, but there is a, I think, a need to absorb that knowledge from our hearts and to be uh, able to and to be consistent to take more steps towards achieving that knowledge and to answering these questions so that these gap can be uh, filled up and uh, we can 
come up with the new uh, answers uh, that are being posed in our hearts and minds. So maybe this is a one question. So, uh, uh, sir, do you want me to go through all of the questions? Yes, uh, but, once, uh, go through all of them, but do do so quickly because we have okay, lots okay. of questions to cover. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the second question posed was about the uh, uh, business investment thought uh, about the East. So it is asked to give two kind of examples that how the Western thought uh, uh, gives uh, present thoughts are biased uh, towards the East. So one of the thought that came to us is about Islamophobia. Like uh, if any extremist event happens uh, from or from any any man or any any person who is Muslim, then this whole religion is being uh, uh, like uh, we are going to or Western people are going to say that this this is whole phenomenon is going to be, to be uh, emerged due to Islam Islam Islamization or this religion of Islam is being the culprit of this uh, extremist thing but when this like uh, two weeks ago uh, persons in Canada like when they the extremist event happens in their country they are just going to say that there is a kind of psychological issues with those specific person they have nothing to do with the religion so this is the one kind of business that uh, is there in western thoughts so similarly another kind of business is about the free trade that uh, most of you have already read I think in the writings of Dr. S. So similarly, there is another kind of biasness in the Eastern authors uh, due to the influence in uh, influenced by the Western teachings. And uh, one of these example can be like uh, in, in our local think tanks, uh, we only make policies for the government that implement to our people. The, just those are just not beneficial for us. And because we are just, just uh, influenced by them so we are just going to blindly implement those policies and just don't think that whether they are going to be beneficial or not so i think that can be so they just keep writing many reports there and they just they just, just proposing these different solutions but i don't think that they are going to be benefiting the society as a whole similarly another example could be the islamic economics where they are just going to take the uh, conventional economics and they are just going to put some factors like zakat and uh, some other sources of islam in, into that specific western economics uh, so that this so the whole economic system that is based on the fault the assumption it is not going to give us the right solutions the third question that is posed was about the balance between uh, heart and head as a source of knowledge so i think that there are different type of questions that are being posed by different sources like uh, the reason uh, is another uh, is one thing that is posed by or that is that the head demands mind demands and the intuition or the peacefulness is the other kind of question being being posed by the heart so there should be a balance between the two uh, when we are going to deep into a reason without having a faith then we may go astray so we must have a strong faith uh, and then we can just support that faith uh, with the reason the reason uh, slowly i think it, it is not going to help and answer our questions so there must be a good balance between the two or maybe we can just uh, say that we shall flow uh, our questions or, or the answers to our questions uh, raising from heart to head Okay, the last questions, uh, uh, just let me just go through it very quickly, is about economic theory applies university to all, so whether uh, it is uh, correct or wrong. So uh, to us, I think uh, it is a kind of a wrong uh, intuition that economic theory applies to university to every country and every individual, and we can generalize it. Actually, we are not able to generalize it because uh, there is a for each country, if we just read or take it as a country-wide, each country has its own unique development experience. Uh, so what it means that each, each country has its own uh, like nature of production. So uh, people have different capabilities, uh, like uh, people in Pakistan does not have equal capabilities like in China, for instance. So, uh, so the nature of employment jobs in Pakistan would be different like in other countries. Similarly, factors of production are different. Uh, so these everything uh, are different in so similarly if we talk about the trade trade opportunities depend upon uh, in, in which uh, region we are so we are going to trade with our neighbors first so 
all the trade theory of or, or the theory of free trade is not going to help us uh, if we are not uh, going to see that with which country we are going to trade or or what commodities we are going to trade similarly there is another aspect of family system like uh, maybe western countries we are not happily or uh, that uh, our mothers are going to work uh, and just to or raise money and uh, and support us all the time so there are different uh, system in uh, across the countries that one development theory uh, one one development theory or one uh, kind of uh, economic theory is not going to uh, help all the countries all the uh, economies uh, like uh, or can we cannot generalize the economic theory for all the countries at once so i think it's all from my side so i hope i have not taken much time no, that Thank was you. very good uh, next up is uh, um who is next? Uh, it's Maaz. Uh, no, sorry, Maaz was already presenting. Lisa. Lisa, is you are presenting. And it may be that I will have to uh, drop out and come back in because the electricity has gone and this computer I am on will lose internet. But I can jo join back in using my um, mobile, which will have an internet. So anyway, Lisa, are you there? Yes, Prof. I'm here. Can you do the presentation for your section now? Section yes, C? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so please go ahead and start. And okay. I will try to also join in from the other computer. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So maybe before I going through the question and answer, uh, I would like to share the in lens, the summary of this section. Um, so actually, the in this uh, section, uh, Professor Saman shared with us about the reflection that he found um, the co contradiction between the <laughs> Islamic teaching and the economics. And he found that actually this uh, happened to, to the um, uh, happened uh, due to the related to the his historical uh, loss of it. I mean that if um, it is, is it possible to happen because uh, many uh, many people in, in the past they they face this this one the loss on faith and this bring um, consequences to the to the trauma loss of it and then the development of the economics. Um, major of economic, which is based on the uh, rejection of the unobservable and uh, based on the secular foundation. So uh, Professor mentioned that this, this uh, condition make the uh, existing economic uh, being unable to identify the hidden reality. So that, that is a, a glance about the topic, the full uh, article of course can, can uh, be uh, accessed. And uh, now I would like to share the points of our discussion. I, hopefully the screen can be seen by everyone. So I, uh, there are four questions. The first is regarding to the examples of the bodies of knowledge which have been uh, shared by historical events. So, According to discussion in our groups, we see that social science, especially the economics, and um, as also elaborated previously in the articles, that the loss of it has consequences to the mindset on how um, the the doctrine that we we are being taught in economics the, about the capitalist mindset and the materialistic uh, uh, we we being taught that it is um, it it took an a, person to need to be a rational to that um, so that um, he or she uh, unconsciously being uh, self self um, centric and the second things that we uh, found is regarding to the uh, establishment of the nascent state that it is bring the legitimacy to this to the state so um, there, there are in many cases that 
the rules of the state um, uh, give the the and give the enforcement for all the society. Uh, the second, uh, regarding to the example of our uh, daily activities, uh, whereby the whole homo economicus model in the economics theories is not uh, lined. Uh, one that we uh, maybe most of us also have ever experienced about this thing is about the experience in spending the money for charity. See, so from economic perspective, it is not rational to spend our money for for something that uh, do not directly benefit us. But uh, in um, from our Islamic teaching, we 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 believe that uh, this is not decreased our world, and uh, so the experience of the pleasure and happiness and the the feeling when we can help other people. Uh, this is the things that that is not. Uh, cannot be measured by the the material things, and the second is the the experience of supporting other people to grow professionally. So, uh, if we see from the economic uh, rational perspective, maybe it is like kind of um, giving our job to others, but because uh, uh, in our teaching, uh, risk is already secured and we it will not be replaced by others so we we believe the our risk will not be taken by other people so it is no problem to to supporting other people to grow professionally the third is regarding to the um, the trauma of loss of faith affect the development of the theories so um we noted that this um this uh, trauma loss of it um, has the consequences on the limitation of the knowledge development um, that it is um, focused on the things that is un the observable. Um, but the issue, there are many things that is not, um, uh, cannot be directly seen. So the, like the concept of Baroka. So, and, and it is also really matters because the, the loss of age here also having on consequences on the, um, the human behavior in making choice. So with, with the loss of it, we, we tend to be uh, exposed to, to maximize our own pleasure so that uh, it, it is having consequences on the, the behavior of our spending. And the, the last question regarding to the uh, some of the harm of the rejection of the observables is about the, the main points about the quality of the human development because of uh, the focus um, focus on the things that can be observed. Um, people tend to see uh, the things that is can be materially observed and measured. So, but we we notice that um, the the most important is regarding to the human quality of the human and the, the morals and it, it is sometimes um, cannot be uh, seen in the in the direct way with our eyes. I think that's all from our thing our teams. Thank you. All right. So good. I've joined again from um, another uh, from my mobile, and uh, the next uh, group, which will be presenting, is Section D. Amna, are you there? Wakar, Amna. Can you hear me?
Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes, Amna. Uh, can we un unmute Amna and uh, and give her? Okay. Assalamualaikum, sir. Ah, Waalaikum Salaam. Can you do the presentation for your side? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very good. I hope my screen is now uh, visible to all. Yes, I am uh, I'm here to discuss uh, the uh, section uh, D of this uh, chapter and uh, the related questions from it. Uh, in the previous section, we have uh, discussed from section C, we have discussed that all the economic theories were developed to serve the interest of powerful and wealthy countries. Mm, these are based on uh, the distorted history, uh, which was just to project the superiority of the West and mm, the inferiority of the East. Uh, reading these histories uh, will uh, uh, create the inferiority complex in our students. Moreover, these uh, modern economic histories are cloaked in mathematical uh, languages and they uh, contain a stark conflict with Islam and economics. Uh, this all have led to um, the concept of logical positivism, which is in detail discussed in section D. The uh, main discussion of um, section D is about the logical positivism, which is a toxic philosophy which forms the foundations of the Western education. The main areas discussed in section D are um, uh, what is basically the logical positivism, uh, what is wrong with this uh, philosophy, why does it appear to be extremely plausible even though it is obviously false, and how can an obviously false philosophy become widely popular and deeply influence thought and uh, action worldwide? Uh, reading up these pages have uh, led us to know that uh, this philosophy says that uh, the, uh, all the knowledge that we have uh, comes from uh, our senses and logic. It denies the value of uh, tradition and faith as source of knowledge. Any traditional knowledge or Quranic teaching must be tested empirically and it must accord with our observations and logic if it is to be counted as knowledge. The um, logical positivism has very disturbing implications uh, as all the uh, non-observable uh, areas are uh, just discarded from uh, the uh, level uh, to be counted as knowledge, including morality, which uh, is just a, mis a meaningless noise. We cannot evaluate uh, uh, using any observations or logic. Similarly, emotions are not part of knowledge. Thus, our feelings uh, of outrage, anger, disgust, or uh, any other um, act are just not uh, the uh, part of knowledge uh, and uh, hence our life experiences and skills are also not part of knowledge. This radical change in the theory of knowledge which took place in earlier uh, 20th century created a radical change in university education designed to convey knowledge. Changes in the theory of knowledge are created by as created by logical positivism combined with other forces led to a purely technical education system and it also led to abandonment of character building as a goal of education and this has caused a uh, uh, huge or great damage globally. Now let's focus to the discussion of uh, the questions uh, related to this section. Question number one was, what kind of knowledge is rejected by logical positivism? What kind is accepted? Basically, as uh, we have noted earlier, that logical positivist uh, theory uh, of knowledge states that knowledge must be built on what we can only see and touch supplemented by the use of reasons. The philosophy of logical positivism is founded on rejection of beliefs in the unseen as superstition. This rejection of intuition and feelings and of heart as a source of knowledge corresponds to a deliberate self-infliction of blindness to central source of human cognition. Hence, logical positivism rejects the knowledge that is not observable and that cannot be perceived by the five senses. And it only focuses on observable visible knowledge and does not consider if there is any hidden knowledge that the five uh, senses cannot perceive. Question number two is, is, why is logical positivism obviously false? What kind of knowledge do we have that is not based on observations and logic? Uh, the uh, philosophy of logical positivism is false um, uh, because uh, to reach the facts or to be counted as knowledge, it so, uh, only focuses on observables, uh, which is uh, far from truth 
as the real world consists of several observable as well as non observable things and uh, facts which can be perceived by heart intuition uh, or, or experiences etc as noted by uh, the hadith of qutsi that the heavens and earth could not encompass me but the heart of my tender believing servant did this is the hidden knowledge we may reach out to the unobservable uh, facts using observable ones Uh, like morality is just meaningless as we have discussed emotions feeling human feelings experiences and skills these all are um, uh, just not a part of knowledge under logical positivism so uh, excluding this all uh, from the uh, group of knowledge uh, makes us to uh, skip behind or leave uh, some uh, uh, facts so uh, making the logical positivism obviously false to be as the used as only basis for knowledge uh, how does the demand for certainty uh, rules out uh, most of the knowledge that we use in our daily life uh, mm, uh, as uh, under uh, logical positivism science is considered to be the study of external reality if taken to be the sole source of valid knowledge then the only knowledge which matter is that the uh, is that of the world around us but the knowledge from our internal world as discussed in earlier slides as well the uh, world of our heart and spirits are not part of science under logical positivism to accept logical positivism is to accept that our internal states feeling intuitions experiences knowledge that our heart have been imprinted with are not part of the genuine knowledge there should not be any doubt about obtaining the knowledge if there is any doubt then mainly the knowledge gained by using the doubtful ones will cause continuation in having doubtful knowledges which further distorts the truth and hinders the uh, reaching reality and uh, this is all just creating the artificial facts lastly uh, what historical events in europe led to the widespread acceptance of this deeply flawed theory of knowledge in the earlier 20th century this question has been very uh, detailed uh, discussed in uh, the section c uh, and uh, uh, it has been referred under uh, the book by edward said uh, that uh, our knowledge has been strongly shaped by european domination of the globe european Uh, conquest and colonization of 19th uh, person of globe in, uh, during earlier 20th century has led to uh, a view of history which focuses on the power and glory of the west and displays all other as ignorant barbarians racist theory of superiority of whites and inferiority of other nations have invented to create justification of colonizations these are widespread throughout the world as part and parcel of the western education and uh, which now dominates across the uh, educational system uh, uh, the uh, the uh, bloody battles uh, between christian uh, factions led to europeans to reject their uh, religion uh, religious facts and they adopted a purely materialistic world view they adopted the purest of pleasure power and profit as the purpose of life and developed the knowledge to help achieve these materialistic goals only uh, the examples are the economic theories which have been developed just to serve the purpose so uh, although science and religion were not uh, in conflicting um, areas till the end of 1800s but the view changed uh, during the earlier uh, 20th century the uh, main reason was the superiority uh, superiority belief of europeans over other nations and they re- um, revised the concepts of science accordingly uh, to their uh, wishes and whims and Uh, this superiority directed them to exploit the majority of the world to make them uh, to be their servants not of uh, allah and to gain just to gain power profit and knowledge the uh, few main events uh, which caused the uh, current uh, thinking of knowledge were the um, uh, large western barbarian conquers uh, or uh, warfares and uh, the struggle between the science and religion across two centuries and uh, the uh, um, loss of faith in christianity so uh, this is all about the uh, section 4 up to uh, uh, understanding thank you very good abna um i have a few comments about the certainty but i think what i will do is write it up because um, but everything else was fine and so i think the last section now is tasir salahuddin uh then um, uh
uh, administration uh, give uh, co-host privilege to Tasir Salahuddin. Tasir, can you raise your hand so that we can track you down and um, and give you the presentation? Oh, good. Okay, Tasir, go ahead and uh, do your presentation of the last section. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Assalamu alaikum, sir. I'm going to share my slides and then I'm going to start. Uh, sir, my slides are visible to everybody. Should I start? I don't see them on my screen. Uh, can you, um, admin, can you make sure that your slide sharing is working? Do you have the slide share button? Just a minute, sir. I think I this is the first time actually I'm presenting via mobile phone. <clears throat> so I don't have any slides are visible. I see. Hmm. On the phone, it's um, uh, you can you present your slides? I don't know. I've never done it on the phone either. Usually the slides are handy by the PowerPoint, and if you yeah, have a PowerPoint, to... please. Right. And then... Actually, for a presentation on phone, you should convert this to Google um, Slides. Then the Google can handle it. On the... um, I'm sorry, system. I have no idea how to actually do that. I'm but trying anyway. to... Okay. Um, I'll have to download them. Can you just uh, discuss it without slides? I see. Okay. You don't have I'm really, on some uh, of I'm really very sorry that they are not here in front of you people, but I'm going to start discussing the main points. Actually, I had um, uh, prepared, I would have started with the introduction of the group members. But let's skip that and go exactly to the brief summary of the uh, fifth um, section or the section E of this uh, exercise. Uh, uh, covers the implications of the logical positivism for statistics, and it all uh, it starts with the concept that um, people think that philosophy is uh, a mere um, uh, following or exploration of idle um, ideas, but that is not what it is because philosophy is really important. The way you think uh, is the way you act. And uh, then it is, it, has, it is discussed by Dr. Sidzaman that European history has, has been discussed by group C and D previously, uh, impacted the creation or the birth of the logical positivism. And it actually um, gave the birth of uh, epistemic arrogance um, with the idea that uh, it is possible to have certain knowledge. Uh, whereas, uh, in contrast, Islam teaches us uh, epistemic humility, where we think that mankind has been given very little knowledge and the actual knowledge belongs to the Almighty. So if we, uh, if we move on with the idea of epistemic humility, uh, then we have to reject the uh, positivism where you are trying to uh, um, believe in everything that you can ascertain with your senses. So the major impacts of uh, logical positivism on economics that have been discussed here are, again, that we have to reject heart and focus on mind. And we have to uh, we, we have to work with the assumption of rationality that human beings are rational and they are able to make best decisions in their self um, uh, selfish interests. And uh, that has actually taken away the motivation of all uh, the activities of e all economic activities that were based on um, kindness and sharing and cooperation and taking care of each other, because that doesn't fall into the logical positivist rational idea. So the motivation for economic activity that's a, that has only remained is the uh, uh, is the 
pursuance of personal pleasures and uh, satisfaction and change of the goal of economic activity has taken away the spirit of uh, humanity out of economics and the impacts of statistics uh, that have been discussed are, are that a uh, normalist point of view has taken um, uh, 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 importance over the realist point of view. And we are only talking about numbers and looking at the data, but not connecting it to the real life uh, experiences and the real life values in uh, human life. So uh, there are certain fallacies that have been created by the positivism. And the three of them that have been discussed here are the forecast competition, where um, the abstract um, and uh, subjective um, uh, competitions are done on the basis of uh, algorithms and um, on different series and it is tried to see if uh, which one is the best uh, predictor. Uh, similarly, we believe that um, if the data gets big and we start learning from uh, the machines, we are start using machines, maybe we'll be able to predict better, but that is not true. Uh, similarly, another um, fallacy is the imitation game. No matter how many times, how well you train the machines and try to compare it with the humans, and maybe a machine may win a certain competitions even, that doesn't make that machine a human. And it's uh, absurd to compare uh, a limited uh, programmed um, machines to human beings who have capacity far beyond that can ever be contained in a machine. So this was the brief summary, and I would uh, move on to the questions now. So the first question uh, was that the term real statistics captures the idea that statistics uses observations and quantification to learn about the hidden real world entities and uh, forces. This is opposed to the conventional statistics based on logical positivism which uses numbers to study the numbers in isolation from the unobserved, uh, unobservable um, real world factors. So uh, we were supposed to give an example of how these two approaches are different in the context of specific real world problem. Um, uh, uh, suppose that we have um, admission ratios biasness in a particular institutions and we see that uh, always the females are being ad, uh, having higher admission ratios in every department. Um, so when we are uh, uh, taking the conventional statistics approach, it may only calculate the gender, gender ratios of admitted population and based on the on numbers can say, yes, there is biasness uh, towards the females as compared to males in the admission process. However, if we take the real statistics approach, Approach and we dig deeper uh, to see if the apparent biasness really exists and why this specific gender ratio exists. Maybe the males in that area are give, uh, being given better job opportunities, better admission opportunities somewhere else that females actually cannot attain. So they go international, the men go international and the admission ratios in a particular area falls, but the females are stuck there. So their percentage is higher. That doesn't mean that uh, by looking at the real life situation of that particular area, we will only be able to answer such questions and not only based on the numbers. So question number two is, uh, given a series uh, from X1 to X100, linear trend and autoregressive are two different methods for forecasting. So uh, the linear trend method assumes the differences are stable across time and uses this as the basis of forecasting. We take, uh, uh, we take that uh, average of the past differences and, make, uh, and use it for the forecasting. Uh, instead, um, suppose one can assume that the rate of growth is stable and take the average of rate of growths then our forecast would be different. It would be based on the averages and not on the basis of the differences. So the question was, which of these two methods is better? And we were, uh, we were supposed to decide um, on the basis of um, uh, uh, answering by picking 100 data series and using the two methods and uh, uh, see if which one uh, gives better results. So we had to explain uh, uh, how um, to choose the data series in a way that uh, make either one of them better. So the answer to this is that uh, uh, in method one, 
uh, will be useful. It depends on the situation. No method, comparing method one or two just on the basis of numbers is not possible or giving a direct answer. So if method one uh, is being used where differences are required, uh, for example, if we want to see how much a new fertilizer has impacted the growth of a particular wheat variety, then maybe method one is good. Uh, and uh, when uh, we are trying to use the rate of growth uh, to analyze something, and we want to compare the impact of two different fertilizers on the same variety of the wheat, maybe method two is going to be better. So uh, that is our response. Question number three is that suppose we were in uh, the judge in the imitation game or the turning test, we have to type in questions and receive responses from two sources A and B, out of which one is the real human being and the other is a computer. So what kind of questions we should have asked to um, understand uh, and lead to a quick decision. Uh, our response was that we would ask questions uh, based on emotions and in, uh, human expressions and core values like compassion, understanding, love, dignity, sacrifice. And uh, many a times when we are talking about uh, human understandings on the basis of life experiences, uh, humans have a lot of fug uh, figurative meanings attached to a particular um, sentence or data that a machine cannot analyze. For example, if we are trying to uh, understand the poetry of uh, Ghalib probably, we would not be able to, um, a machine is not going to understand the way a human is going to. Similarly, question number four says, explain why big data or machine data learning would not have been able to forecast the global financial crisis of 2007 and eight. Um, the response to this uh, question is that um, uh, basically, uh, the experience, even if the big data was there or our machine learning was there on the basis of the model that were being used and if the past history and experience was not there, the machine would not be able to uh, predict or uh, <coughs> predict the existence of this sort of um, financial crisis because the model that we have fed to the machine the machine is only going to be limited to the responses on that so it is not the amount of data or advanced machines which can judge the real life impacts of policies after all humans feed the models to the machines and if models of humans understanding are flawed no machine or big data can help predict and secondly uh, human knowledge no matter how advanced it is still fallible so correct prediction is not uh, a possibility uh, as a fact thank you all right so we have covered um, we have covered all five sections this has been 90 minutes i think this will be our usual lecture length and this is the process i have some comments which i will actually made uh, make in um, public to the group now uh, basically our this was chapter 0 which is not technically part of the book so chapter 1 we will start uh, next lecture, which will be two weeks from today on Sunday. And uh, the course will be open for, I, I think, one more week. And then we will uh, start, uh, close down the registration, and work with the students who have registered until then. So one of the things I would like to ask you is make sure I have a desired audience. I, as I said, this is for master trainers, for teachers of statistics. So I would like to ask all of you to to invite teachers of statistics to take this course. I'm not really so much interested in students because uh, I need to have a geometric effect. And so if I have a teacher, then he can teach many other, he or she can teach many other students. Now, in terms of the last uh, question that you just answered, Tasir, the issue is not so much about the models that we use. And it's the issue is that the data, the, the methods of data analysis look at the data to see what pattern is there. So if the global financial crisis never occurred, nothing like that occurred for the past, you know, until basically it's the biggest event since the Great Depression. If you look at the past 30 years of data, there is not a single, it is never going to show you that because it never happened in the past. And all of the data analysis technique looks at the past to predict the future. So if something never happened in the past, then any data analysis will say if something is impossible in the past, it is also impossible in the future. So because global financial crisis was a unique event, which nothing like that is in the past of the 
data, then no method can actually predict it, which is based on data analysis alone. Now, if you go behind the data to the real world factors, then it becomes possible to predict, but not on the basis of data alone. So that's just one comment. So, um, okay, so basically uh, that's it for today, inshallah. Um, we don't really have time for question and answer because the time is all up. Uh, next time we will try to find some uh, way to keep the time limit so that uh, other students in the audience can also participate. But basically one of the means is that uh, students will be formed into groups and they will communicate with the group leaders so we can actually have uh, by, by this two-stage method, we can have everybody in communication with me. And of course, everybody can write to me directly if there is a question. All right. Thank you, everybody. Inshallah, this has been a very fruitful lecture and inshallah, a good learning experience for everybody. And I hope to see you all uh, next uh, in, uh, in two weeks on Sunday. All right. Assalamu alaikum. We can finish this session now.